Today I wanted to talk about the essay India by Richard Rodriguez. When I was a child growing up Catholic, I always had an altar to the Blessed Virgin Mary in my room, as all my friends did. And when I came to be teaching Chicano literature, I was automatically interested in the female icons, especially the Aztec goddess Tonansen and her similarity, her connection to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I was, I'm just interested in the idea that she could be one more rendition of a larger earth mother goddess. And when I read uh, Richard Rodriguez's essay, it just seemed to clarify for me so many of the things that I was interested in. Um, let's talk a little bit about Richard Rodriguez. He's the son of uh, working class immigrants born in 1944. <clears throat> He's had controversial views on bilingual education and affirmative action. In fact, he's famous for it. Um, most famous is his Hunger of Memory from 1982, but he's done other works, Mexico's Children, 1990, Days of Obligation, 1992, for which um, uh, he was nominated for a Pulitzer. Um, his last book so far is Brown, The Last Discovery of America, 2003. Rodriguez says, I write about race in hope of undermining the notion of race in America. His life's contradictions include being a queer Catholic Indian Spaniard at home in a temperate Chinese city, he's talking about San Francisco, in a fading blonde state, talking about California, in a post-Protestant nation, or the United States. His idea that the browning of America is part of inevitable of the inevitable goal of global modernization and in this essay he uses the same idea only he says it's the inevitable goal of the earth mother the, of the goddess it, it was her intention all along to uh, to <laughs> to achieve global modernization as we put it today When he talks about the title India, he is talking about a, a, a life force. It's, it's not the country India, but it's, it's, it's sort of his name for the goddess. Um, he, he, he uses this word to mean erotic, fertile, passive-aggressive, unstoppable Indian female life force. Uh, he says, when I began this book, this was Brown, I knew some readers would take race for a tragic noun, a synonym for conflict and isolation. Race is not such a terrible word for me. The word race encourages me to remember the influence of eroticism on history. Within any discussion of race, <clears throat> he says, there lurks the possibility of romance. Now, in his introduction to India, I'm going to go to page 52 and read what he says. Right from the beginning, I used to stare at the Indian in the mirror, the wide nostrils, the thick lips, such a long face, such a long nose, sculpted by indifferent blunt thumbs, and of such common clay. No one in my family had a race, had a face as dark or as Indian as mine. My face could not portray the ambition I brought to it. What could the United States of America say to me? Then later, next paragraph. Mestizo in Mexican Spanish means mixed, confused, clotted with Indian, thinned by Spanish spume. What could Mexico say to me? And then he talks about the Mexican philosophers and their term Indian fatalism. 
He says the phrase is trusted to conjure the quality of Indian passivity as well as to initiate debate about Mexico's reluctant progress toward <clears throat> modernization. Mexicans imagine their Indian part as dead weight, the Indian stunned by modernity, so overwhelmed by the loss of what is genuine to him, his language, his religion, that he sits weeping like a medieval lady at the crossroads, or else he consorts with death because the purpose of the world has passed him by. So when he asks, what could the U.S. say, say to this face, he recalls that Indians, by, you know, just the way the United States has treated them, are, have disappeared, have passed, been passed by in history. And when he asks, what could Mexico say to this face, they say something negative. Indian fatalism, passivity, are to blame for Mexico's, quote, reluctant progress toward modernization. And then he gets into one of the most interesting ideas. He calls historians wrong. He said that Columbus thought he was coming to India when he landed on the New World, North America or South America, and um, mistakenly called it India. Well, in this essay, he says literally that these European explorers did come to India, and that's the India of his title. Um, proving the world is round, looking for the passage to India, the explorers call the New World people Indians, and what Rodriguez says is that they were uh, uniting separate, separated peoples, two halves of the world, that India was already there waiting for them. He's referring to the fact that the Indians um, you know, uh, the, have, have the Asian roots that they walked across the Bering Strait all the way from Asia. And so when, when Columbus makes that discovery, he's actually completing a whole circle. And Rodriguez says of this that there is some demi demiurge felt by the human race of the 15th century to heal itself, to make itself whole make that make that circle complete and he calls it a uh, sexual attraction something mutual now with this sexual attraction the you know the 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 uh oh i should go back here here's how he explains it on page 58 let me see if i've got this So let me just read what I've got here because I I, th I thought I had it on the on the PDF file. But what he says is, had the world been flat, had the European sought the unknown, then the European would have been as great a victor over history as he has portrayed himself to be. But the world was round. The entrance into the Indies was a reunion of peoples. The Indian awaited the long-separated 
European, the inevitable European, as the approaching horizon. Certainly, in retrospect, there was some inevitability to the Catholic venture. According to the European version, the stag version of the pageant of the New World, the Indian must play a passive role. Europe has been accustomed to play the swaggart in history. Europe striding through the Americas, overturning temples, spilling language, spilling seed, spilling blood. And wasn't the Indian, the female, the passive, the waiting aspect to the theorem, lewd and promiscuous in her embrace as she is indolent betimes? Indolent meaning lazy or lethargic. So he is making reference to the Mexi I mean to the Spanish father in Cortes and the Mexican or Indian mother uh, as La Melinche or Marina. And then he goes on um, and and talks about how Mexico precedes this father and mother. He says Mexico has no public monument to Cortez, the rapist, the father. But Mexico takes its national identity from the Indian mother. Now this one I think I've got here. Let's go to page 63. Yeah, here we go. Whereas, I'm, I'm at the bottom of the left-hand side here, page 62, whereas the United States traditionally has rejoiced at the delivery of its landscape from savagery, Mexico has taken its national identity only from the Indian, the mother. Mexico measures all cultural bastardy against the Indian, equates civilization with India, Indian kingdoms of a golden age, cities as fabulous as Alexandria or Benares or Constantinople, a court ha as hairless, as subtle as the Pekingese. Mexico equates barbarism with Europe, beardedness with Spain. I love these paintings. Um, the one is Diego Rivera. And on the right is Antonio Ruiz in uh, Malinche's dream, where the woman is the land holding the city. So uh, he, he gives us La Malinche's point of view. And let me go to page 73. Okay, here we are. And he talks about uh, La Malinche being the, uh, uh, right here where it's marked, the most famous guide in Mexican history is also the most reviled by Mexican histor histories, the villainous Marina La Malinche. Marina becomes the lover of Cortes, so of course Mexicans say she betrayed India for Europe. In the end, she was herself betrayed, left behind when Cortes repaired to his Spanish wife. And in this, she prefigures La Llorona. Nonetheless, Marina's treachery anticipates the epic marriage of Mexico. La Melinche prefigures as well the other, the beloved female aspect of Mexico, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Because Marina was the seducer of Spain, she challenges the boast Europe has always told about India, that Spain conquered the New World. I assure you, Mexico has an Indian point of view as well, a female point of view, not this, this male conqueror point of view. And this, and he uses italics here in his writing to indicate the voice of the goddess. I opened my little eye 
and the Spaniard disappeared. Imagine a dark pool, the Spaniard dissolved, the surface triumphantly smooth. My eye, the spectacle of the Spaniard on the horizon, vain glorious, the shiny surfaces, clanks of metal, the horses, the muskets, the jingling bits. Cannot you imagine me curious? Didn't I draw near? And then his voice again. European vocabularies do not have a silence rich enough to describe the force with an Indian contemplation. I want to talk more about this um, two-sidedness of Lama Linche. So let me uh, uh, show this portrait by Rosario Marquardt, 1992. And we see the power of the eye, the eye that connects two worlds or two faces. Um, we see the dichotomy of the goddess. There's a good side and a, I shouldn't say good and bad. I should say positive and negative or maybe more like death on one side and life on the other. Um, we're all aware of the negative uh, aspects of La Llorona. These are just some, some that I compiled off the internet uh, representing well, all the negative sides of, of womanhood, of whoredom, betrayal by a, a man, abandonment by the man and abandonment of her children, and ultimately death. But La Malinche prefigures also the Virgin of Guadalupe, representing the purity, uh, um, a mother's purity and love fidelity and and life and this dichotomy this this two-sidedness is also just com is so common in the Aztec mother earth figure of Coatlicue uh, she contains opposing facets uh, sometimes she's called Sihuacoa'o, and that prefigures the, the bad or the negative, the La Llorona stereotypes. And sometimes she's referred to as Tonansen and Coatlopeu, uh, which prefigure the good or the positive, the, the aspects more associated with the Virgin of Guadalupe. Uh, this is a statue, a stone work um, near the base of the Pyramid of the Moon in Tenochtitlan. So let's talk about this positive aspect and the fact that these are all kind of meld together. Uh, here we see again in a painting Juan Diego 1531 on the hill called Tepayac the ancient site of the temple to Tonantzin. And let me read a bit from page 68 from the essay. And again, Rodriguez uses the um, poetic, italicized text to tell Juan Diego's perception of the goddess who whom he would have been probably perceiving as Tonantzin. And he says, Just as the east was beginning to kindle to dawn, he heard there a cloud of birdsong bursting overhead, of whistles and flutes and beating wings, now here, now there. At the top of the hill there shone a light, and the light called out a name to him with a lady's voice, Juan. Juan, the lady light called. Juan crossed himself. He fell to his knees. He covered his eyes and prepared to be blinded. He could see through his hands that covered his face that the poor light of day was no match for this lady, but broke upon her like a waterfall, a rain of rings, 
She wore a gown the color of dawn. Her hair was braided with ribbons and flowers and tiny tinkling silver bells. Her mantle was sheer and bright as rain and embroidered with thousands of twinkling stars. A clap before curtains like waking from sleep, then a human face, a mother's smile, her complexion as red as cinnamon bark, cheeks as brown as persimmon. Her eyes were her voice, as modest and shy as a pair of doves in the eaves of her brow. Her voice was like listening. This lady spoke in soft Nahuatl, the Aztec tongue, as different from Spanish as some other season of weather, as doves in the boughs of a summer tree are different from crows in a wheeling wind who scatter destruction and ka 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 Nahuatl, like rain, like water flowing, like drips in a cavern, or glistening thaw, like breath through a flute, with many stops and plops and sighs. So Rodriguez goes on with this after this beautiful idea of the of the of Juan Diego seeing Tonantzin and and perceiving also the Virgin Mary the, the the first sight of the Virgin of Guadalupe um, and Rodriguez talks about it being a Spanish trick in the essay I don't think I've got this there. Let me just check. No, I don't. Um, I'm just going to go back to the essay and read this bit about the trick. He said he was telling a friend of his about this. And uh, and she called this whole thing, you know, like a, a, a recruitment poster for the new religion, she said. The... Juan Diego story. Um, <laughs> an itinerant diva with a costume trunk on page 70. And on page 71 he explains the joke. He says, the joke is that Spain arrived with missionary zeal at the shores of contemplation, but Spain had no idea of the absorbent strength of Indian spirituality. By the waters of baptism, the active European was entirely absorbed within the contemplation of the Indian. The faith that Europe imposed in the 16th century was, by virtue of the Guadalupe, embraced by the Indian. Catholicism has become an Indian religion. By the 21st century, the locus of the Catholic Church, by virtue of numbers, will be Latin America by which time Catholicism itself will have assumed the aspect of the Virgin of Guadalupe, brown skin. So you see how he developed this idea into a whole, a whole uh, extra book called Brown. All right, let's go on and see the big picture from La Malinche's point of view. Um, this is on page 74, but, but keep this picture in mind. Let me go back here. Where he says, look once more at the city from La Malinche's point of view. This is about more than halfway down the left side. Mexico is littered with the shells and skulls of Spain, cathedrals, poems, and the limbs of orange trees. But everywhere you look in this great museum of Spain, you see living Indians. Where are the conquistadores? The Indian stands in the same relationship to modernity as she did to Spain, willing to marry, to breed, 
to disappear in order to ensure her inclusion in time, refusing to absent herself from the future. The Indian has chosen to survive, to consort with the living, to live in the city, to crawl on her hands and knees, if need be, to Mexico City or L.A. I take it as an Indian achievement that I am alive and I am Catholic, that I speak English, that I am an American. My life began, it did not end, in the 16th century. The idea occurs to me on a, week, on a weekday morning at a crowded intersection in Mexico City, Europe's lie. Here I am in Mexico City, the capital of death. Life surges about me, wells up from subways, wave upon wave, descends from stairwells. Everywhere I look, babies, traffic, food, beggars, life. Each face looks like mine. No one looks at me. Where then is the famous conquistador? We have eaten him, the crowd tells me. We have eaten him with our eyes. I run to the mirror to see if this is true. It is true. In the distance, Mexico City stands at the prophetic, as the prophetic example. Mexico City is modern in ways that multiracial, ethnically diverse New York City is not yet. Mexico City is centuries more modern than racially pure provincial Tokyo. Mexico City is a capital of modernity. For in the 16th century, under the tutelage of a curious Indian whore, under the patronage of the Queen of Heaven, Mexico initiated the task of the 21st century, the renewal of the old, the known world, through miscegenation. Mexico carries the idea of a round world to its biological conclusion. And we see this power of the goddess, that her, you know, her intent was always to unite the peoples and circle the world. And we see it alive today, this uh, power to, to eat people with my eyes. It lives in the perceptions, in the self-perceptions of Chicanos, like this um, painting by uh, Yolanda Lopez, 1978. So another painting, Esther Hernandez, 1990, where the Virgin reveals herself on the back of a thoroughly modern, high-tech Chicana of indigenous ancestry, illustrating symbolically how Latinas literally bear their cultural identities with them as they deal with the contemporary world. The power of the goddess is in everyday life, in tattoos on people we see on the streets, in art posters, on walls, on clothing. The power of the goddess is in Chicano literature. Gloria Ansel Dua's famous Borderlands, La Frontera, uh, in that she talks about Coatlicue's multifacets Tonantzin and Coatlopeo prefiguring the, the, the positive Virgin of Guadalupe and the Sihuacuao prefiguring the negative or La Llorona. And in her How to Tame a Wild Tongue that we read already, um, we see the same sort of idea of Indian strength quiet strength that survives everything. Um, let me read from page 50. I believe it. I've got that scanned. Yeah, here is, here is from Ansel Dua's uh, How to Tame a, a Wild Tongue. And I just want to read this last paragraph. Los Chicanos, how patient we seem, how very patient there is the quiet of the Indian about us. We know how to survive. 
When other races have given up their tongue, we've kept ours. We know what it is to live under the hammer blow of the dominant Norte Americano culture. But more than we count the blows, we count the days, the weeks, the years, the centuries, the eons, until the white laws and commerce and customs will rot in the deserts they've created, lie bleached. Chicanos will walk by the crumbling ashes as we go about our business, stubborn, persevering, impenetrable as stone, yet possessing a malleability that renders us unbreakable. We, the mestizos and mestizos, will remain. And Anseldua was just the beginning. Um, we see uh, Corky Gonzalez referring to Tonantzin in his poem, I Am Joaquin. He says, I am the black-shawled faithful women who die with me or live, depending on the time and place. I am faithful, humble Juan Diego, the Virgin of Guadalupe. I am Tonantzin, Aztec goddess, too. Uh, Viramantes in um, the Caribou Cafe takes this duality of Coatlacue uh, and makes her into a defiant La Llorona heroine. So it's not La Llorona, but more Gritona. And Sandra Cisneros in Woman Hollering Creek does the same thing. Instead of the victimized, weeping woman, La Llorona, um, she brings out the, the stronger, hollering woman. And if you read that story, you find her holler is, is, is a good sound. We see the power of the goddess everywhere, from ancient Greek and Roman times and, and uh, from the Middle East to India, um, in the environmental movement today, and uh, in, in our own Statue of Liberty. Um, the U.S. has a goddess icon, but most of us don't even see her. We, we see the Statue of Liberty, but we don't think about what she stands for, that she is a woman, that she is a goddess. Uh, she is the Roman goddess Libertas, and she greets the immigrants, and she stands there. She's not the classic Roman conqueror, not a male in armor, but a strong female entity like La Melinche or India who subsumes the male aggressor and engenders a new identity. She is not conquered. She is not raped. She is not the masculine power of Europe, but she is incorporating all newcomers. She is eating us with her eyes. Okay, that's all I've got for Richard Rodriguez's India. Um, I hope you'll contact me if you've got questions. I love talking about this stuff, so, so please ask questions.